So a uh, warm welcome to any of our guests who are with us for the first time this morning. We're grateful to have you here to worship our God together. We did. We had two memorial services yesterday. Kyle Winger, uh, his grandmother passed away, and Kyle was radically saved a few years back. And I went to the service, and his mom, his grandmother, taught at Denver Christian for like 35 years. So when you're in your 90s, you don't usually have the whole place packed out. And it was just packed. And Kyle got up and probably preached the, one of the clearest gospel messages I've heard in my life. And when he was done, the whole place started clapping. They just exploded in the power of the gospel. The only time you guys have ever clapped for me was because I was done. <laughs> and it was just beautiful to see what God's done in this young man's life and how he used him at that service. And then Margie Hunt, what jumped out to me was these two beautiful ladies who began meeting with her and going and led her to Christ towards the end of her life in her 90s. And uh, she was just all together born again and, and just watching the whole body uh, from the meal to all the service that took place here. I was just sitting here overwhelmed with the beauty of uh, God's body and how he puts it together and works. So it was just a beautiful day. And then uh, the kids, I, I don't have any candy this morning. I had a bunch of you come ask me. I, I'm gone. It's gone. But I, you learn a lot about children when you're holding a thing of candy. So um, some did so good and some reminded me of myself. I, on Halloween, one night I went to this house and I was an unbeliever, kids. And it had a big bowl and it said, uh, we're gone, just take one. So I took the whole bowl and poured it in my little pillow sack. And there was a couple of you doing that last week. So <laughs> I am going to chat with your parents and you keep journeying to become like Jesus Christ. <laughs> one day you could be a preacher. <laughs> well, this morning we'll continue in our study through Romans. If you'll turn uh, to Romans chapter 9. Uh, we've, we've been looking at this book for two years, and we've been looking at the beauties of the gospel in Romans 1 through 8, and my heart's just been taken up with the grace of God. And I just see why Paul, every letter he wrote, he, he wished his recipients grace to you. I just, this is my heart for everyone. Grace to you and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, we will look at a new section. We're going to be looking at chapters 9 through 11. And my heart is filled with such anticipation because what I've already seen in this section is just transforming. And so I'm praying that that would be the same for all of us. To, to go from a man-centered view of life and history to a God-centered one, that, that lands you in Romans 11, 33 uh, through 36. But for from him and through him and to him are all things, to him be the glory forever. Amen. That's where we're journeying, and that's where I want us all to land. There's some hard and difficult things to understand in these chapters, uh, and so we're going to journey it together, and we'll need the Spirit to illuminate His Word to our minds and our hearts as we study this Word. And so we need to begin where we should, humbled before God, asking Him to help us through these sections of Scripture. And so, again, my prayer is that you would receive the Word in humility, and that we just go and say, God, don't let me tell you how you have to be, but you tell me who you are. And so let's go into this word and, and let God show us who he is, that he would be worshiped and adored by his people. Let's pray. Father, I do, I pray that we would all land just in worship and realizing that everything does come from you and everything is through you and everything is to your glory and that you would receive glory forever and ever, amen. That is what you have saved us and brought us into, a God who's worthy of praise, a God who will be praised by his people forever. And so God, thank you for the foretaste, for the beauty of what we just did, to sing your praises together corporately and to worship you. God, we thank you for that. And I just pray now, Lord, lead us to these verses. Guide us into the truth of them. Don't let us stray to the left or to the right, Lord, let us come now and just be taught by you. Lord, show us your glory. And I just praise you for it. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. I think the most important part of Romans 9 through 11 is to make sure you take this diamond and you put it in the right prong. That we need to understand Paul's heart and his argument 
Because he spent three chapters on total depravity that you would understand the depth of your sin, your inability to break out of it or change your nature. He had just three chapters. And then he spent three chapters on the cross and justification by faith in Christ alone. And then three chapters on the subject of holy living to our God and our eternal security. And now he's going to spend three chapters on this subject. And it's, so it's not small. This is big in redemptive history. And it needs to be understood if we'll ever get to the Mount Everest, the top of redemptive history. And that we finish and we all just stand and sing the doxology together from our hearts. And so we need to truly get the importance of what Paul is doing in this section, or you will miss the forest for the trees. And so I don't want this section to just become debates on the doctrine of election or nuances about Israel. These are in this passage and must be understood, but they all feed into this one big thing of where Paul is driving it. And so what is it? Well, look back to Romans 8.35. <laughs> that powerful finish to the whole section. Who then will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake, we're being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am absolutely convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. There's the crescendo. And we have marveled and we have worshiped at the purposes of God in Romans 8 and the faithfulness of God that he will bring his children to glory. Nothing can break it. Nothing can stop it. Kyle, you're here, brother. Dude, you preached it. So proud of you. I can bank my whole eternity on God's faithfulness for those whom he foreknows. When he sets his love on you in eternity past, great things happen, and his love will save you, and it will bring you safely to glory. And then we're going to come to Romans 12 through 16, and Paul's going to say, this is how you live in light of the gospel. But first, Paul has a burden upon his heart, and it, it's deep. It's a deep burden. He carries it with him. He's going to say constantly. And it's that the Israelites have rejected their Messiah for the most part. His people, God's people, the ones who belong, the covenants and the promises and what we'll look at this morning, the, the ones from whom Messiah, Jesus Christ, came from. Christ came to his own and his own did not receive him. That's the stumper. God's mission began with the Jew to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Jesus said, I came for the lost sheep of Israel. And we're just watching the gospel now. It's advancing and it's going into Gentile territory. And the response of the Jews to this gospel is becoming less and less, and hostility and animosity in their hearts is increasing more and more. By the time Romans was being written by Paul, the majority of the Jews are unbelieving and rejecting of their own Messiah. When Rome was written, the majority of them were Gentiles. And so Paul himself has suffered bitterly at the hands of his own countrymen. They're persecuting him and they're hounding him on every turn. Paul's own ministry began first to the Jews. He'd go to the synagogues and they would throw him out. And what is more now, they, they hate Paul as well. And he's preaching, they think the gospel is against Torah. He's throwing out everything of our history of what Moses gave us. <clears throat> they're guilty of sin as the Gentiles, uh, the, the Jews are being told they're as guilty as the Gentiles in sin. They're dogs. They're the rejected ones. How dare you? You all need to be saved. And not by law, but by Jesus Christ alone. There's only one remedy. And they feel it's a, against Moses, and it's against Abraham, and it's against circumcision. It's against being Jewish. And they, they hate this message by faith in Christ alone. They want to be tied to Moses, not Christ. And so it's cooking their grits. And Paul writes this, 
And he says, Gentiles are being brought into the promises that were made to Israel by faith in Abraham, justification by believing what God has said to bless the nations. And they're now children of God. Peter said, a chosen people, a royal priesthood. They have the hope of glory. These ones are being told that nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so catch this. Here's the primary issue. If that is so, Paul, these Gentiles who were strangers and they were separate from the promises of God through the whole Old Testament, they're now being brought near. They're drinking up the promises that were made to Israel. I will be your God and you'll be my people. What's happened to the first sons? The ones that he set his love on and he took, he took to be his people. He delivered them out of slavery and gave them all these blessings, the whole Old Testament. If they have no security and they've lost these blessings, the loving election of God and his faithfulness to carry out his purposes failed. To live and bank your whole life on this gospel. Romans 8 has declared it so well, and I'm just begging you to bank everything on how secure you are in Christ. And Paul's been just fighting for it and fighting for it. But Israel had the same promises of God. And the majority of them sit now in unbelief with anathema. They're under the condemnation of God. Nothing can separate you. Nothing can bring you under condemnation again. Israel's under condemnation. So my question this morning is how do we bank on the promises of God? Did God change his purposes with Israel? Did his faithfulness fail with Israel? Are, are, are they an elect nation? Were they loved of God? Can anything separate them from his love? Were they not adopted? Can they quit being children of God? <clears throat> and if they are rejected, God's electing love on them has failed. Thus, what confidence can we have that it will not fail on Gentiles who have been grafted in. And so the issue of these chapters, I hope you see, is big for our eternal security and our rest and our confidence in the purposes of God. And so you need to get this, and you need answers to these questions because Paul's whole argument is our salvation cannot be severed because of the immutability of God's purposes. Paul knocked down every enemy that could come against God's purposes in Romans 8, 31 through 39. Nothing can stop his purposes. Nothing. But what about Israel? <laughs> and so the question maybe is not so much Israel, but as to God, to defend God and his faithfulness. My whole life is built on the faithfulness of God and his promises to keep them. And in every high and stormy gale, every enemy, every temptation, for me to stand against it all and to lose my life, to die for this gospel, I need to know that God's electing love and purposes in my life cannot fail, do not change, and do not come to an end, or scrap the plan and come up with a new one. I need big, strong answers to this problem. That's what we're after. Reckless, abandoned Christians who know that God will not change his purposes. And so we need to answer this question. And the answers are going to take your breath away and give you bedrock confidence in the word of God and all of his promises to the people of God. What kind of warriors and mighty men and women and children could this produce in our midst? That's what I'm praying for. Commentator Thomas Schreiner succinctly put it this way. If God promises to Israel, if God's promises to Israel have not come to fruition, then how can one be sure that the great promises made to the church in Romans 8 will be fulfilled? That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I always love when someone says it in one sentence. Boom. The answer is our theme verse, if you look with me in Romans 9, 6, and we will take that up next week. But it's not as though the word of God has failed. For they, are not, uh, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. And so we're going to take a look and try to understand what Paul means there. But we're going to see that the, the purpose of God has not failed. 
The primary theme is the faithfulness of God and his freedom to show mercy upon whom he desires. And we're, we're going to just see God is free. His very glory is to show mercy to whom he desires. And amongst Israel, you're going to see that there was always an elect among that nation. And so God is free to save whom he desires. That's what he's going to show us. That's the theme. To show mercy by how he will show mercy. And I want you to get this. His ways do not have to be our ways. And they don't have to be approved by us. They don't have to be understood by us. And they don't have to even be logic out by us. You come to this and you be like Job. Let him declare to you who he is. And you not declare to God what he must be. That's an idol. God has to be what I fashioned in my mind instead of being what he's declared himself to be. And that's what I'm going to ask you to come journey with me and see that beautiful answer. So come sit with your hands over your mouth and let God teach you. Until you say, I've heard about you with my ears, but now I see with my eyes. You're God and I'm not. I repent and I'm silenced before you. That's the stuff that I'm asking God to do for us in this section. And so this section is not just predestination. It's not just Jews and Gentiles. It's bigger. It's the theodicy of the justification of the ways of God with respect to man. And Paul's going to harmonize the whole Old Testament with the New. What God has done, what he's doing, and what he will do. And he's going to show that there is nothing that is contradicting God's purpose with Israel. The eternal and glorious consistency of God with his sovereignty over all. This is about the person, character, and being of our God. And when we get done, I pray you'll cry out, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. <laughs> How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. Quit searching them and trying to tell them that's wrong. You just worship. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became his counselor, or who has first given to God that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things, to him be the glory forever. Amen. And so what we're going to get from this section is a radical God-centered view of history. And I believe the church today, it has become so man-oriented and need-directed in our churches that one preacher cried out and said, the church is starved for the greatness of God. It's just become so humanistic. And this section just puts God up where he is. And I pray that we just marvel at the greatness of God and just who he is, and he's free to be God. We must preach God. He should be the focal point of this service from beginning to end, that he's lifted up, worshiped, glorified, adored, and praised. I just want someone to come to the church one time and, and just say, hey, does your church exalt God? Not, how's it going to make me feel? How are my children going to feel? How are the unsaved going to feel? Is God lifted up from beginning to end? And is the word reverenced and preached? And is the worship vertical? That's what I'm looking for. And I'm just going to re read one quote by W. Pink, and we'll get into our passage. He said, the God of this 20th century no more resembles the supreme sovereign of holy writ than does the dim flickering of a candle the glory of the midday sun. The small g, the God who is now talked about in the average pulpit, spoken of in the ordinary Sunday school, mentioned in much of the religious literature of the day and preached in most of the so-called Bible conferences, is the figment of human imagination, an invention of maudlin sentimentality. The heathen outside of the, uh, outside of the pale of Christendom from gods out of wood and stone, form gods out of wood and stone, while the millions of heathen inside Christendom manufacture a God out of their own carnal mind. But in reality, they're atheists, for there's no other possible alternative between an absolute supreme God and no God at all. A God whose will is resisted, whose designs are frustrated, whose purpose is checkmated, possess no title to deity, and far from being a fit object of worship, merits nothing but contempt. With that, let us approach the passage that's before us this morning. I want you to consider last week, Paul hit a peak. I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God. 
Now in Romans 9, 2, I have this great sorrow and unceasing ceasing grief in my heart. <clears throat> what happened, Paul? What happened from the peak of nothing can separate me from the love to this burden that I have for this, my kinsmen? Paul's moved his thoughts to the unsaved, the members of his own race, those in blindness that he once sat with. They're under the wrath of God. And I just want you to consider the bunch that he has this heart for. It's the, those who five times I received 39 lashes from the Jews. Five times they almost killed me. They beat me within one stripe. I've been in danger from my countrymen. Every time he started a church, they would stir up mobs and drive him out of the city. And when he would leave, they would send teachers to try to subvert his new churches. At the end of his life in Jerusalem, 40 zealous Jews bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until Paul is dead. Such an amazing hostility against this man. And I can see why they hated him, but the amazing part to me in this passage is Paul's love for them. He has a agape for this group. I love my fellow countrymen. Why, why Paul is going to say about those who dogged him all of his days should bring us to our knees for love for souls. I pray that God would give Southside Bible Church a spirit like Paul's. This is unbelievable who he's got this burden for, how much they hate him and want to kill him. I think of Jesus. Oh, Jerusalem, those who are going to kill him. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling. He tells a parable. He says, go out to the highways and byways. Compel them to come in. Those who are resisting. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were entreating through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ. We beg you, be reconciled to God. I watched my dear brother beg at a funeral that you would deal with your soul and make sure that you're saved, that you would know this Christ. I pray for the Whitfields and the Spurgeons and those who don't just walk around just, ah, they're heathen. They're just rejectors. They, they love liberals. And just dismiss them. And here's this group that just wants to kill Paul. And he's just like, here's my heart towards them. I just wish they knew this Jesus. I, I came across a sermon of George Whitfield in the 1700s, late 1600s, I think it was actually. And I'm just going to, here's the close of his sermon. Brothers and sisters, my own heart is enlarged this morning to you all. I trust I feel something of that hidden and yet the powerful presence of Christ as I'm speaking to you this morning. It's indeed sweet. And all the harm that I would wish to you and even my enemies without cause, that you would feel and know what I know of that powerful and sweet presence of Christ. Believe me, it would be hell to my soul to return to my natural state again. Yet I would willingly change states for you for a little while that you might know what it is to have Christ swelling in your hearts by faith. I just want you to know the beauties of Christ. If I could give it up for a little bit that you could taste it, I would do it. It's getting closer to what Paul said. So let's take it up this morning in Romans 9. Here's your outline. <clears throat> Paul, we're going to look at three elements of Paul's heart then to the Israelites. You can see that his heart's full of pain, his plight, and then the privileges of the Jews. So first, let me just set our structure to the passage. There's one main statement here in verses 1 through 5, and everything else is going to modify it. And in verse 1, I am telling the truth. I'm telling the truth in Christos, in Christo. I'm speaking as one who's in Christ I have died and I've risen with Christ. I'm a new creation. I'm not speaking carelessly. This isn't hyperbole. I'm speaking as one who knows Christ and is looking down upon what I'm saying and speaking. And he says, secondly, I'm not lying. Greek word is pseudes. I'm not telling you a lie. Uh, I'm not trying to smooth you. I'm not making something up to look 
good. I'm not just throwing out a careless statement. This is the truth. This is the truth of my heart. And then he says, my conscience is bearing me witness <coughs> in the Holy Spirit. My conscience is even bearing witness. And the key is the conscience is independent of us. We can't say something that doesn't mean the conscience agrees with us. We can't pull one over our conscience. We can't manipulate it and go against it unless we sear it. So no matter what, our conscience will render an opinion to us. And so Paul's making his statement even stronger. In the Holy Spirit, the independent witness. The conscience is not perfect, it is fallible, but it's enlightened in Scripture and taught and educated. We learned that in our seven-week study on it. And so Paul is saying, my conscience bears me witness, but it's a conscience that's enlightened by the Holy Spirit of God, which is the highest point that a conscience can be. And so I just want you to see how hard Paul's laboring at this. I'm not lying. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. My conscience is saying amen, led by the Spirit of God. My heart isn't pulling one over with me. I want you to see how hard he wants you to know this is my heart. Charles Spurgeon said, Brothers and sisters, I am sometimes afraid that our zeal for conversions would not stand up to the test of the Holy Spirit. Paul's did. The Holy Spirit testifying, this is my heart. So what is it, Paul? Well, this pain that I have, this pain, I'm telling you the truth in Christ, I'm not lying, my conscience testifies of me in the Holy Spirit. Verse 2, that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. Word for sorrow is pain, suffering, distress, mentally or, or spiritually. It, it means grief, deep grief. Um, and so Paul said, I got this deep pain and sorrow. And he, he puts this uh, preposition on the front of it. It's, it's the Greek word mega. I have this mega sorrow and pain. He uses what's called a double emphatic to, to just show how deep the burden of his heart is. I, I've got this deep, deep pain and grief in my heart. It's unceasing, he says, uh, grief. It, it means without stopping. It just, it's always there, this grief or agitation, and my heart is the core of my being, mission control center. So get this, please. This is not just his theology. It's not just these truth about other people that's out there. This is the burden of Paul's heart. He's fighting for you to get that. God, give this to us. Give this to every one of us in this assembly that we can understand your big and your great purposes like election and who you harden and whom you soften and keep a heart like this. This is the heart of one who believes in the sovereignty of God. And some of you know this very well with your kids, close friends, uh, if you have an unsaved kid, I guarantee you when we were looking at Romans 1 through 8, you're marveling at the grace of God. And while you're worshiping, you're burdened for that kid that you wish would surrender to this gospel. And so we're sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. And here's Paul. I, I am, I'm celebrating this gospel. But within my own heart, man, I have a burden for my own kinsmen. And it's deep, and I'm telling you the truth. This is what I feel. And so what is it, Paul? What's your plight? Second point. That's his pain. Here's his plight. The present spiritual condition of Israel. Verse 3, for I could wish that I myself were accursed or separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. What a statement. I was shocked how many tried in the commentaries to explain this away said so Paul would have never really wished this. It's not doctrinally accurate. <laughs> Spurgeon said this, the commentators that have taken the bowels out of this statement. He says, if you take passionate expressions to pieces with icy hands, you'll never understand anything which comes from the heart. This is Paul's heart. And his heart is that the Jews are anathema. They've been delivered over to the divine wrath of God. And he has huper on behalf of what? Of my brethren. I'm so, I, I would give my soul on behalf of my brethren, the Jews, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. 
Here's the one who, who labored for three chapters on the message of condemnation. He knows what it means to be under the wrath of God. He's articulated it so well and so clear. And all of a sudden he turns and, and goes back to that condemnation and says, I wish I, I could be under that condemnation again. I, I would go back under that condemnation. He knew it. If I, and separated from Christ. Who loved Christ more than Paul? For me to live is Christ. Everything was Christ to Paul. He loved his union with Christ more than anything. Let, let me be separated from Christ and let me come under the, the condemnation of God and be accursed. I could wish it if it were possible. We know it's not possible. Paul can't atone for their sin. But this is just one who's caught up in love to souls. He understands election. He understands what God's doing in history. He's going to reveal it all in this section. But he can't just look at it coldly, cold doctrine, cold facts. Here's the heart of him looking at humans, a kinsman according to the flesh. Oh, I'm broken over their rejection. I want so bad for them to taste the grace of God that I sit here drinking and Romans 8 and all that God's done. Eternal hell versus eternal heaven. How bad I want you to have this, Israel. It's a grief that I carry with me daily. I want you to know the grace of God in Jesus Christ. I was thinking of Moses when the deliverance where he goes to Mount Sinai and he's called up to receive the law. And he's up there 40 days and the, the nation gets restless. And they get Aaron to make a substitute God to act for them now that Moses is gone. And they made a calf out of gold, and Moses comes down, and he just takes it and burns that calf with fire. And he rebukes Aaron publicly. He executes those who led the rebellion. About 3,000 died. And he prayed this in Exodus 32, 32. But now, if thou will, God, forgive their sin. And if not, please blot me out of thy book, which thou hast written. So I think this morning our application is pretty straightforward, really straightforward. What is your heart toward the lost? Do you have even a ray of what Paul is talking about this morning? I don't even want to start looking at the doctrine of election until you have a heart like this. If this gospel's in your heart, Romans 1 through 8, it's got to find an outlet. It's got to care about those who are under the condemnation that you lived under all your days till God delivered you. The gospel is not meant to be a trophy on your mantle. It's not an heirloom. It's not merely a theology. Guys, it's not a weapon. But it's the power of God to bring men, women, and children under the realm of salvation. That's what this gospel is. Let's look at the privileges that drove this even deeper in Paul's heart. It says in verse 4, who are Israelites. Who is a relative pronoun used to bring out the character or quality. Who, you could say, who are such that you're Israelites. And he didn't say Jews. That was many times to contrast Jew and Gentile. Hebrews is because they spoke Hebrew. But an Israelite meant the special religious position of members of the Jewish people. They were in relationship to God and his promises to them. He's, he's just drawn out. You're Israelites. You've been drawn near. God's come near and brought you in. You're Israelites. And to whom belongs the adoption as sons of all the nations? God said, I loved you. And I've chosen you, Israel, to be my people. And there's, it's not the adoption that we're reading in Romans 8, but it's a special relationship among all the peoples and all the nations. Israel had that special classification. In Exodus 4.22, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. And I said to you, Let my son go, that he may serve me. But you have refused, Pharaoh, to let him go, and behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Jeremiah 31, 9, with weeping they shall come, and by supplication I will lead them. I will make them walk by streams of waters on a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Then belong the adoption of sons. Israel had the glory, the Shekinah glory that led them, the fire and cloud, God's presence with the people of Israel. 
God has given manifestations of himself to this people. They have approach and presence. And he says, you have the covenants. It doesn't tell us which ones, but the covenants, plural, of God's comprehensive commitment to Israel. Their welfare, their blessing, salvation, it's been revealed in the covenants. Abrahamic, God says, I will take you to be a channel or instrument that I will bless all the nations with the gospel through. You've been given those Israels, and you were given the law, that mountain shaking, and God's desire for his people and how my sons will live, and the revelation of God's will. And you had the temple service to sacrifice and to come in and have that day of atonement and all that you had in the temple and the services, and you had all the promises promises that were given. The the Gentiles were outside the promises and covenants. You had the promises from God. And whose are the fathers? It's interesting, this whole section begins with the fathers, and next week we're going to look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then he's going to close it out in 1126. And he's going to say, and so all Israel will be saved, just as is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, and he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And from the standpoint of the gospel, they're enemies for your sake. And from the standpoint of God's choice, they're beloved for the sake of the fathers. And this whole section is going to be joined with those bookends, the fathers. You have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob where God went and started this nation in the beginning of of his work of redemption. And so these are the ones that God moved into covenant relationship with. You have the fathers. And then he takes your breath away and says, and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh? The best privilege ever. The Messiah of the world would come from your stock. The root of Jesse, the seed of Abraham, the son of David. Messiah is going to come from this nation. And he says, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. And so they missed that he was not just from their stock, but he's very God. Jesus was God. He was the promised one for all of Scripture. He's going to destroy. He's going to crush the serpent's head from all that he's done. He's going to be the seed that was promised to bless the nations. He's going to be the one, Isaiah said, his name is mighty God, eternal Father. And in Luke 1 through 2, they begin getting it. This is the promised one, the, the, the one who's fully God and fully man who's going to come. And Simeon says, let thy bondservant depart in peace, for my eyes have seen thy salvation. This is what God has sent to save sinners and bring us back to God. So here's Paul's heart breaking. And he's looking at Israel saying, I stood where you stood. Israel, you are so blessed with privilege more than any other nation. But I want you to hear this. That's not what you were to rest in. You were to rest in what all that privilege pointed to. And all that privilege was pointing to Jesus Christ. And I just wish that you could see through all your privileges and see the promised one that it pointed to. You, you missed it. You missed it. You killed him you're rejecting him and you're killing me who's preaching him to this day. And that's the grief that Paul carries because he lived under that and he was doing the same thing, killing Christians, anyone that named that name. And now his heart, I just wish all these ones who are looking at their privilege and missing Jesus, I just wish they could get it. And if I could be condemned again and you could have this joining to Christ, I would do it. And that sits on me daily, Paul said. And I guess in closing, what what is America? We're not as covenant nation. But I, I say we sit under a nation that was formed as one nation under God. And what we have lived in, so much privilege. We have churches on every corner. I grew up, freedom go anywhere to church. There's usually a Bible in every home. Nation that was kind of dressed in morality, it's being undressed. But we just kind of rested in that week after week 
as a nation and as churches. And all these privileges that we were given were to point you to Jesus Christ. And I just think, how many are going to choke on their privileges? Some of you were just raised in good Christian homes and you just had so much privilege. And you sit here this morning resting in the privilege that the Bible was opened and you were taught the Word of God and you were disciplined and all these things. I just, privilege. And I stop there. I'm a good, moral, nice person. I help in the church. I serve in the nursery. And if you don't, you should. I just choke. And you're going to die without being joined to Jesus Christ. Because a privilege is where you stopped. And that's what the Jews did. They stopped at privilege and never got to what the privilege was pointing to. Have you come to Jesus Christ or did you stop short and just enjoy the American privilege and churches on every corner? Are we repeating the exact same thing? How many possibly in this congregation who just go through life wanting to raise a nice family and go to church and read Bible just to your children but not to yourselves and you're happy to pass your days in privilege but are not alive to God in Christ Jesus? I would that I would be damned that you could be saved rather than spend your days in privilege and not get to Jesus Christ. That is the heart of Paul. Don't stop short of Christ. And I pray for all those little ones who came and got candy from me last week. Pastor loves you so much. Don't, be, don't rest in just having Christian parents. You need to be saved. And there's a Savior who came into the world to save you from your sins. It's not enough to just have Christian parents and be in a church. So if you're two years old and you're sitting in this service, good job. <laughs> Look to Jesus and believe in the, the Jesus that your mom and dad love this morning. Little stone, look to Jesus, the living rock. Believe upon him and be saved. And so I ask, have you drifted to just judging and looking down on unbelievers versus a deep, deep indebtedness to tell them of the grace of God that you live under? To be willing to do whatever it takes to take this message anywhere and everywhere that we can go of the saving Jesus Christ can save. And so I, I pray that God would give us something of what Paul was feeling in every heart and not just be gnarly reformed people who know all the doctrines and couldn't give a rip about other people. And so I pray God soften our hearts to love and care that I was under condemnation and God brought me out by the grace of God and nothing in me I just want to tell everyone I can about this name. And I don't want anyone at Southside Bible Church to rest in privilege. Let all the privilege, you have so much privilege, let it lead you to the one who gives life. So don't stop short of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I come before you with a broken heart. God, our hearts are burdened with a nation that's had more privilege than any nation. <laughs> we've had the pure, we've had the gospel. And we've had it lifted up and preached from corners and all over. And we've just become a nation that has stopped that privilege and are satisfied with conservatism. Father, let no one in this room come short of Jesus Christ. Come all the way to Christ. He says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. 
I will give you rest for your souls. God, I pray, let everyone, what we've seen in Romans 1 through 8, believe in the Christ who died the death in their place and who gave a perfect righteousness to the requirement of the law in our place. God, let every soul call upon his name and be saved in this room. God, I thank you for this gospel and I praise you. I praise you. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.